Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sawalif with me, Hamid Ammari. Good morning and good afternoon for people watching from the United States. I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Nadine Kaslow. And today's episode is about mental health. On Instagram, we have a couple of questions. On Facebook today, I'm sure we will have quite a few questions in the interaction from the audience. So this topic is uh, very near and dear to my heart. So without further ado, I will throw to you, Dr. Kaslow. Tell me very briefly why you are the person that we get to be talking with today. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone. I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm on the a professor at Emory University School of Medicine here in Atlanta, Georgia, and also the chief psychologist for all of our hospital services in our department. Um, and I have been doing mental health work for decades now and think it's really important. Love talking to people in other cultures and countries about mental health so we can raise awareness and reduce some of the stigma. I'm also the past president of the American Psychological Association, which is the largest association in the world for psychologists. And I've been really involved in helping uh, everybody try to cope more effectively with the pandemic. So happy to talk with you about mental health today. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, the word stigma came in, and I think that's the first place I want to start. Uh, there is a stigma, I mean, uh, attached to mental health and mental well-being. Um, I don't like to generalize, but uh, certainly for myself, growing up abroad and having quite a nomadic upbringing, uh, I was exposed to quite a lot. And then coming back to Qatar, being someone who can, you know, asking for help when things are too much, the stigma around it is that there's something wrong with you. And, you know, it's like, oh, they're off to the loony bin always. And that's not the case, is it? No, absolutely not. I think that unfortunately for, for generations and generations of people, we sort of had this sense of either you had a mental health disorder, which somehow meant you were, as you put it off to the loony bin, that you had really serious mental health problems, which some people do. And they were sort of blamed for it. Either their family was blamed or they were blamed or they were cursed. There's sort of all sorts of theories about it, none of which are true. We know now that there's a biological or genetic component to serious mental health problems that is then made worse by stress. But it is not the person's fault. It's not the family's fault. And then I think of mental health and well-being as a continuum. Many of us may not have serious mental health disorders, but we struggle with things like depression, anxiety, grief. Those are kind of common everyday things that so many of us, probably just everybody who's tuned in, if they're honest with themselves, has, has felt some of that. And if not before, then during the pandemic. And so just struggling to, to cope, to deal with all of the stresses in life that that's really pretty common. And then we want to keep going on the continuum. We have sort of wellness, mental health wellness, or mental well-being, where we can be resilient, where we can find ways to cope well with our stress. And we're each going to do that differently. We, we, let's get the pandemic out of the way, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that this was a time, period, I mean, challenging for everyone, of course, but for a lot of people, they were, you know, they were alone. And the biggest fear, I guess, or the biggest challenge is to be alone. And sometimes when you're forced to be with yourself, uh, it starts unearthing some of those, you know, concerns or anxiety or depression or, and a lot of the coping mechanisms that would have been, you know, normal say if you had support groups or if you had a reference or a group of friends or anonymous meetings or activities or they were completely gone so some of this god forbid we go into another lockdown or into some kind of isolation again 
what what are some of the coping mechanisms when you're left alone in a in a, in a quarantine scenario with no human interaction? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think to normalize it, to recognize that if you're feeling sad or you're feeling lonely or um, you're feeling really anxious or scared, that that's understandable and it's normal. And it, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It's, it's a common reaction right now. And, and sort of not being hard on yourself is really important. I think that another thing that's come up and many people are said, well, I'm alone because my relationship ended or nobody loves me or my loved one died. And so they end up sort of dwelling on sort of the past and what if their life had been different. And I think it ends up that people then feel even worse about themselves. And I think to the extent possible, staying in the present and looking to the future is important. We have also seen that people have found incredible ways to be creative during these periods of lockdown. And so I really encourage people to be as creative as they can. And that's different for different people, whether that's Zoom dinners or taking aerobics online or getting online for religious ceremonies and just finding ways to stay as connected as we can. Fortunately, a lot of things have moved online now. Therapists have moved online. Uh, like you mentioned, these 12-step groups have moved online. So there are way more options there than there were at the beginning of the pandemic. But I just think finding creative things, a lot of us are doing things like puzzles and word games and things that we haven't done maybe for, for a long time in our life and, and finding that or picking up instruments or learning how to cook new foods or gardening and really encouraging people to do as what, what speaks to them. It's different for each of us. Um, but I think really being creative and trying a lot of different things and seeing what's helpful. For someone to make that transition though, to find, like we talked about feelings and fighting those feelings sometimes is the reason that you could be potentially why you keep driving yourself down and not recognizing mm -hmm that these are just, you know, sometimes you have to feel low to, to appreciate the highs. You have to have mm -hmm. anxious moments in life to know how to deal and how to grow emotionally, let's call it. But mm -hmm. there's a huge, you know, there, there's a lot that needs to happen to get from the point of recognizing these feelings and then getting to a point where you are comfortable picking up a hobby or, you know, for example, I can only talk about myself. Um, and when I was 18, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. And I had no idea what that meant. And the first reaction was go to a counselor. Your work is being affected in university. You're away from home. And pills. They just, you know, they threw a bunch of pills at me. And that whole experience, for me personally, was not you know, going on medication straight away was not the best because it really changed me completely. Even got to the point where, uh, you know, my mother was like, you are not my son. Like there's mm. something completely mm. different. What are you doing? Are you on drugs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, yes, <laughs> they mm -hmm. gave me drugs. <laughs> I'm all drugged up, mom. <laughs> and for, for, for you to be able to kind of, that was too quick in, in my opinion. Like the, the, the counseling part of it could have been a bit more. It could have been something that was, you know, talking, talking about it first, you know, um, would have been something that, uh, that would have, I guess, not had the same effects in the long term, you know, because having a confrontation with mother, the, any mother, like they, this is the cliche, I know my kids, you know, mm -hmm. yes, they do. <laughs> and mm -hmm. for me to have that kind of conflict arise because of me seeking help, um, it wasn't always the, you know, in my opinion right now, it's, I mean, this is a long time ago, but it did take away quite a bit of my life to understand mm -hmm. that this could have, there could have been so many other ways to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And that, 
is that a, like is the stigma a product of how people in society would deal with you and then how it becomes a clinical solution rather than a you know than a community or a social or 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 a more of a support group rather than it being i mean i felt like the jump to, to pills straight away was was a bit too much like mm -hmm. Well, first, first of all, I'm sorry that you started struggling at, at that age. That's really tough. And, you know, I, I think people are really different. I honestly never see pills alone as the way to go for mental health problems. So somebody who has clinical depression, if they're really struggling to sleep and struggling to eat and their concentration's really off and they feel suicidal, medication may be need to be part of the solution pretty early on. But no matter what the depression's like, I always think counseling needs to be part of it because the medication can deal with the sort of biological part, but the stress and what people are unhappy about, what they're depressed about needs to be dealt with and having ways to cope and manage better, that has to be, in my opinion, part of the plan. And so whether or not medication is added later, if somebody still needs it and the counseling's not enough, started at the beginning, or maybe they never need it, I think there always needs to be counseling when people are struggling with things like depression and anxiety and sort of low self-esteem and I don't know what I want to do with my life. And um, so I, I do think that just giving a pill, you know, it's faster, it's cheaper, um, but I do think for many people, it adds to the sense of there's something wrong with me and I need this medicine to fix me. And is there, we, we talked about it's, it's at the start, talking about family and in your society and the people around you, wouldn't they play a big role? I mean, I come from a big family and it's, it would be, it would seem that you, because they're there in numbers that, oh, it's great. We could talk about you know, but there is, you know, structures in society and positions, you know, you're the big brother, and this is the mm -hmm. uncle, and there's respect in culture, and oh, there's nothing wrong with you, man up, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're, I'm 12, <laughs> you right. know, like, how am right. I supposed to man up, <laughs> right. I just want right. to play football, you know, and things are happening in my life, Mm -hmm. whether it was bullying or whether it was being a different skin color or whether it was just having a different accent or all of these things matter you know mm -hmm. they're your formative years and you're exposed to so much and you don't you know unless you have a a mentor it will be very very difficult you know and for me that was my parents but even then because of the role you know oh, you're the big brother or whatever it would have been at the time, it was, there are still things that you can't talk to your parents about. Right. And right. in a society now, for Qatar, it's a very diverse society and social media coming in on it is, is it's a huge like limelight. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's voluntary, sometimes it's involuntary, you know, whatever you post or whatever, there's no more kind of, let me go hide in my corner for a bit and let this all go away <laughs> because mm -hmm. we've seen the effects of a tweet on people from right. nine years ago. And it's, it's, it's a kind of, this is the reality that we live in. And then that adds, as you said, stress and anxiety and depression. These are all different kind of uh, alert things, you know, the, the, like the pinging that goes on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think of mental health as, you know, there's sort of the biology or genetics inside or neurochemistry, then there's the individual and how we cope and how we manage things. And then there's our family, you know, our immediate family, our broader family, and then our community or communities and cultures. And I think, you know, all of that can add to our stress at any level. But I also think that all different levels should be involved to prevent mental health problems and to address mental health problems. And so, you know, I, I think that just fixing the individual 
is, is not sufficient. And that's why I think we need prevention. I mean, you mentioned social media. It can be great. You got a series of questions from Instagram and now we're doing this on Facebook. There's lots of wonderful things about social media, but if you're being cyber bullied, you know, it used to be if you were bullied at school when you got home at night, it sort of calmed down. Now, if you're cyber bullied, it's 24 seven. And so I think that part of it is dealing with things that are happening at the community level and the cultural level and, and really looking at some of the norms, some of the patterns and ways we can change things so people feel better about themselves and each other. So what would it be mean if we have to go and get to look at the individual? I mean, I like how you layered it, but it's not as pragmatic as that in real life. You know, you are an individual, yes, but you were still always part of a group. You know, I'm, I'm a CEO, therefore I have subordinates or team members or a board director that I have to report to. And, I, you know, we all have, we all, there is mm -hmm. no, it's just me. Right. <laughs> so, you know? Yes, we are not <laughs> islands. Right, right, right. And that, I, I guess the, it takes self-awareness, I guess, to, for you to go, okay, I have a problem between mm -hmm. you and yourself or having it pointed out to you or, you know, how do you get to the point where you just break down your own walls to accept that maybe I need to go seek some professional help or even talk to a community or, or that if the social stigma around it is that if I go there, I'll be viewed as this. Okay. I'll be viewed as a weak man or I'll be viewed as someone who cannot handle life or it will affect my working environment. It will, it, there is a, at least here when I talk to some people about, I mean, on social media, there isn't a lot happening in Qatar. There's about six or seven uh, institutions or communities that advocate and deal with mental health. Uh, not necessarily the you know, psychiatric uh, clinical uh, level, like pre that, the counseling and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes getting there, uh, uh, getting to there is, is the last, uh, is the last resort. Like mm -hmm. they, it, it, it gets to a point where everything is broken. They, mm -hmm. you know, they've lost their, their friends or they've created so much conflict and, and this it, it gets to a point where they're finally alone in terms of I have no friends I am really struggling and now I must go and seek help mm -hmm. how do we help uh, normalize the idea that it's okay to talk to people about or professionals about problems that could help you as an individual grow Right, right, because we don't want it to get so bad that everything's broken, because, you know, the, the, the worse things are, the, the harder it is to turn them around. So we want people to feel like they could go earlier. So I think one thing, even having conversations like this is part of shifting a culture and thinking about, you know, how to have media campaigns and talk, you know, convey that, that these struggles are normal and they're understandable and that getting help means actually that you're strong, not that you're weak. It means you're willing to admit that you're, you're having a hard time and get help. And, and that's actually, in my opinion, the strength. I think it's making services more available. And so some of the things that have been done are building mental health services or programs into schools so that kids get a message from a very young age. And not just that the kid with the problem goes over there for the mental health services, but like prevention programs. So I think schools that talk about stress, how to cope with stress, anxiety, depression, like normalize that from the beginning um, is really important. I think having um, mental health or behavioral health professionals embedded in say doctor's offices. So when you go for your physical or you go for take your kid to the pediatrician, that that's just part of what the check-in is. The part of the well check-in has to do with your mental wellness, not just your child's physical wellness. And same too with adults. And I think if we build it more into our systems, then it's, then it's much easier for people just to, to access it. 
the truth is right now, I think a lot of people are turning to mental health professionals online because they don't have, nobody knows they're going there. Nobody sees them. And actually the, the use of mental health services during the pandemic has just skyrocketed um, in, in part because people are stressed out and in part because people can do it from their office, their home, wherever they're at. And other people don't even know it's going on. And um, I think that for me, one of the silver linings maybe of the pandemic is some normalization of mental health challenges and getting help. I mean, for me personally, Qatar, I live in Qatar, a very small community. Um, and I've been going to therapy for about five years now, or even mm -hmm. longer, but it's been online for that long. And I chose online because when I went locally, the sense of, you know, running into my therapist with some common friends in a restaurant that I'm going to go to on the weekend to have dinner with my wife is too much to handle. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. it created more anxiety, knowing that I had to, you know, physically undress my soul in front of this person, you know, and then even me, I fell victim to that kind of, you know, it's not to say that that person is not a professional, they're going to break the confidentiality, but it does even that alone is a stigma. You know, I'm still part of this ecosystem and this community. And, and for me, it was, it became, yeah, I think it was my, my, my epiphany. It was when I was 27. So it was, it even changed the, 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 the way I did therapy and mm -hmm. couldn't get it here. So it had to be online because of all of these things. Right. So I don't think either you or I want to convey the message that anybody listening, the only way to get yourself help is outside of the country. I don't think we want to convey Definitely that not. message. Definitely not. So, yeah. so, you know, the truth is most of the people I see in therapy, whether on Zoom or, or in the office at some point in the past and hopefully again in the not too distant future, um, live in the same community that I live in. And while I live in a big city and certainly a big country, I actually have, a. it's, even though it's a big city, it's sort of a small town in certain ways. And I see a lot of same medical professionals that work in the same building that I work in. We, we sort of see each other and interact in different kinds of ways. Um, and so part of it is learning how to navigate that those boundaries, learning how to be able to talk about it. Um, and if there's less stigma, then I think if you bump into somebody that you know or that knows your therapist, it actually becomes easier as the culture destigmatizes mental health problems. But if you're somebody who's listening in right now and you say, oh, I cannot do it in this country, it's, you know, I'm too known or I, I just don't want to have that interaction in any way. Um, then fortunately now there are other options and the pandemic when things going online has allowed for there to be even more options. So, you know, I think everybody's gonna find a different way forward with this. For some people it's gonna be support groups or if you're struggling with alcohol, it might be AA online. And for other people it's gonna be counseling or therapy either with somebody in, in your country or, or globally. And I understand your point about introducing it in schools and making more awareness and this is part of the the reason is that people listening can you know we want to spread this the message that it's you know the whole reason for having this show done is that i could talk to strangers and i know you know i read your bio and understood who you were as an individual but from your professional circle and we're still two strangers talking about a very controversial subject for us sometimes in certain places and talking it might be received that you know this person is in america talking like americans and we're in qatar and they want to change our way you know and for me it's 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 individuals that make up a group, that make up a, a community, that make up a society. And, and we are, you know, the core of it is an individual. Mm -hmm. And 
as an individual, you should always, I mean, I know it sounds like, oh, yeah, this is a utopian way of like, oh, once you fix the individual, then that fixes the whole group that fixes the, you know, but how do you, there's going to always be a resist to change, whether it's new technology or new planes or new self-driving cars, whatever it is, there's always people who kind of, we like this, this was good. And part of this is mental health. And mm -hmm. these ideas or ideologies or the things that you're introducing are against our culture or our, our, uh, you know, our box. This is how mm -hmm. we do it. Mm -hmm. So how do you face challenges like that? I mean, it's very, it's not always easy to have a conversation. No. And, and certainly I, you know, if, if I say things that are culturally insensitive, I, I certainly want to hear about that. And I, that's, you know, I do have a lot to learn and I, I appreciate very much that cultures do this really differently. Um, and, and it's really important to be respectful of that. And on the other hand, I feel like there are some things in, within cultures and unfortunately within more globally that, that haven't worked so well. Um, and I think when, when we recognize that, that there's been a lot of people struggling in silence and suffering in silence um, and that, that we, don't, we don't want it to be that way. And so I sort of say to people, you know, what really matters? I mean, does your life feel meaningful? You feel like what you're doing has value, you have value, you're able to pursue the things that matter to you and you have a real sense of purpose and meaning. And if the answer to that question is no, I'm kind of adrift, I don't know, then, then you know, I think then you need to think about what, what can you do differently to, to get that sense of purpose and meaning. And I don't think counseling or therapy is for everybody. I think there are lots of different ways to sort of get our lives on better tracks. But I think if our life isn't on a very good track, we need to be proactive about getting it on a better track. I do think, however, if I'm really struggling with depression, I'm wondering if my life is worth living, my anxiety is so bad that I can't go outside when there's not lockdown, it's really interfering with my relationships, with my family life, with my work or school life, then I think people probably need to at least seriously consider if they're willing to, to try some mental health services. Um, because probably if you're at that point, you've tried everything you know how to do. Um, there are a lot of good self-help books. There are a lot of good apps out there right now. And I encourage people to look into those. Um, and, but if you continue to struggle, I don't feel, it's sad to me to think that people have to struggle alone um, and suffer and not, and not feel good about themselves and their lives. The, the, I mean, the struggling alone, as I said, uh, for me, it was from a very young age. Like, uh, and that was just how you, you know, you were part of it and you just dealt with it. Uh, for me, sport was an escape. Music was an escape. Um, friends, certain friends, all those, you know, some of them were great. Some of them were not so great. <laughs> that was part of the, you know, part of uh -huh. the... But it wasn't, uh, it, it was an escape in the sense of it is an escape. You feel imprisoned, you know, mm -hmm. you feel like there is, because you said that getting meaning to your life and things like that, that is a big thing. Like that is, that in itself is, you know, some, some people identify as members of a group and that's the meaning, you know. Mm -hmm. My meaning of my life is that me and this dude or me and my wife and or me and this group are doing this and this is our way of life. And and if that was ever to like if that was ever to be dismantled in a way, like, for example, in the pandemic that that got those people alone and they were forced to be alone, that kind of unearthed a lot. Like for me, mm -hmm. we were in lockdown and my wife was very, very pregnant <laughs> at mm. the time. And it got a bit, you know, because of 
personal business and personal uh, projects, it all came to a screeching halt overnight. That took its toll. And you recognize, like, at, I'm at a stage where I recognize the patterns. Like, I still, getting out of bed is, you know, you wake up in the morning and it's there. It's like, ah. And now, you know, <laughs> you get used to it and you, you just, it's a struggle. Like, you get mm -hmm. up knowing that you have to beat yourself every day mm -hmm. you know like i have to wake up and show me that i'm better than me <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because it is not wake up all sunny and and you know oh yay it's a new day that's not always the case you know mm -hmm. and if you're identifying and searching for meaning and you have that meaning dictated and then something happens where it shifts or some, something uh, destabilizes that meaning. Generally, it, it is a fall. It's like Jenga, you know, mm -hmm. you, you move a couple and then it all breaks down. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I guess the way is to either look in or to attack everything outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the reaction is, is, oh, that's why he's, he's crazy, you know, or mm -hmm. this, we all, I always knew he was crazy, <laughs> you know? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. I, someone... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I do think, you know, when those things fall apart and our sense of meaning is lost or our identity feels lost, it's, it's really, really hard. And, and again, it's something every one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, has gone through probably more than once in our lifetime. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really helpful is to stop and say, you know, what are my values? What are the things that are most important to me right now at this time in my life? So being a dad to a new child might be high on the list, you know, um, and, and thinking about what are the things that, that matter the most and, and how can I pursue them? I think one of the things that, that's hard in pandemic times is people schedules sort of help people stay organized. And I think that many of us had less sort of things in our schedule. And I know one of the things for me that's really important is to build in self-care time, to, to actually put in my schedule time to do nice things. So for example, I used to dance ballet professionally in another, in a leather lifetime. And um, I still take ballet lessons. Wow. And um, that's really important to me. In the beginning of the pandemic, that was not possible. And then they finally went on Zoom. And it's not great, but it's better than not doing it. And building that into my schedule or uh, building in when we're not on lockdown, taking long rides and seeing different parts of the state where I live that honestly, I've never explored before, but doing it in a way that, that can be safe. And I think, you know, with, with family, and I think that it's really um, important to sort of stop and say what really matters at this time? What are the things I'm going to prioritize? Or for me, it's been about giving giving back to the community and going to the ICUs where COVID patients are treated every week and being there as a support to the staff. That's given me meaning it. I think it's been supportive to them, but it's also made me feel like I'm doing something every day that, that really helps the system cope with the pandemic. And so I think for each of us, it's to say, what are my values? What matters to me? And how am I gonna to build in things? And sometimes that means scheduling things, scheduling the exercise, scheduling the time with friends or family. Um, because if you're down or burned out or struggling, you just never feel like doing those things. Yeah. You just never um, if, feel like doing them. If you, I mean, if you are in a, at what stage is this? Because if you are scheduling it and you're down, it'll just be a calendar notification that you can just delete. <laughs> you know, you'll let it ping for a week. And then it's like, you know what? You are so stuck in that zone. And yeah. you will be accused of being selfish if you want to take time for yourself. Right. You know, I need, I need, I need an hour. Mm -hmm. just, I, need, I need my time. I need a nap. I need to just leave me alone for a bit, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. how do you, like, there's, I sense if you are 
18, 19 in university and you had this community and you were going out with your friends and you're probably in student accommodation or you live with your family and you have, you know, a, a lot of the interactions nowadays at home here are on this, you know, everyone's, you're in the same room, but no one's talking to each other, you know? Oh, right. <laughs> and, and when that's kind of the normal, Mm-hmm. And, and you're forced to look up because everyone else is doing, you know, is locked away and they're not in their community and they're not in university or even when they're in their dorms, they're locked away alone. Mm-hmm. It's, it is challenging. Like it is something that you, if, if you weren't forced to do it, like because right. this was something that you were like, it was in your face. There was no getting away from it. You know, this was the law. You got out, you got fined, uh, if you didn't follow the procedures, like you had to schedule when you could go and buy your bread and milk and eggs and make sure, you know what I mean? It changed your life mm-hmm. completely. So, mm-hmm. but in times when you're not forced in, in outside of the pandemic, outside of lockdowns and quarantines and self-isolation, and there is a sense of sitting yourself down. That's the first step. Like that mm-hmm. and that, how do you get to that? Like what right. are the, you know, what needs to happen for you to kind of go, okay, I'm done. You right. know, I need to sit with me and do what's best for me because something's not working. Right. That is, that is a big step for a lot of people. Certainly it, for me, I was, you know, mm-hmm. I, it, everything fell apart. Like <laughs> everything mm-hmm. fell apart. And that's yeah, what it, made me it, go it, it, it is a huge step. So, you know, I, one of the things I think about is like a car. I mean, we have to put fuel in our car to keep it going. And this sort of notion of I don't have time for self-care or self-care isn't allowed. Well, to some extent, we're kind of like a car. And if we don't put any fuel in, we don't put any nourishment in, self-care in, we just stop. We just reach a point where we just can't keep going. And so I think that it, it is really important that we can't take care of our partners and our parents and our kids and our jobs if we're not taking care of ourselves. Um, and I don't think this it means being selfish and being narcissistic. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just finding, you know, some, some scheduled small amount of time, but in a regular way where we, where we do things for ourselves. I think part of what's happened is that, you know, prioritizing, thinking about ourselves, taking time for ourselves also needs to come with being more compassionate toward ourselves. I think we're kind of low on being nice to ourselves. Many of us are way better at being nice to other people, being understanding of other people, but have a really hard time being understanding of ourselves. And so I think the extent to which we can know that we need time for ourselves and be really kind and gentle toward ourselves. I think that can make a big difference because I would bet that a lot of people listening in today are actually pretty hard on themselves and they're nicer toward other people than they are to themselves. And so if you're gonna stop and say, hey, I'm really struggling or just I need some play time for me, I need some time away for me. And I think if you have kids and you have a partner and you have a job and lots of demands, Part of that's a negotiation. How are we going to make all these puzzle pieces fit together? Because if you don't take care of yourself, if I don't take care of myself, you know, one day we just can't get up and go. And the, the sort of the whole thing falls apart. I was uh, definitely someone who did things out of spite. And one of the things that is something that was like, you can't do this. You must do this. Being dictated to He's just never, ever sat well, you know? There is no, from a young age, it was like, okay, you have to do this to please this. And you have to, these are your responsibilities um, as a son. These are your responsibilities as a student. And it was scheduled, you know? And when you played football, you were on team and you played, you know, you were, there was a lot of things going on. But as soon as someone said, this is not the right way to do something, that's when I just lose it. And it was like, you, you don't know, <laughs> because mm-hmm. there's a lot of inside. Because 
it feels very, or at least I kept receiving it as, as a way of, it was very demeaning. It was very kind of, uh, you know, I'm a person, you know, I have, there's a lot going on here that you don't know mm -hmm. about. And you right. can't, you can't just come in and boom, boom, boom. This is all wrong. You know? <laughs> what, so it, what, yeah. It's interesting. Cause I was sort of the opposite. I was a goody goody. And so <laughs> I, you know, kind of anything I was supposed to do, I did it and I did it to the nth degree and I did it well. And it ended up with the same outcome in a way, because, you know, the truth is none of us, whether we do it out of spite or resist it or we're goody goody and do we everything we're supposed to do. At the end of the day, none of us thrive and flourish if we're doing what we're told we're supposed to do. It, that, that just really honestly doesn't work for any of us. And if we really want our kids, our, the people that work with us to, to thrive, to flourish, to be creative, then we need to, to be more partners. We need to be more collaborators and we need to spend less time telling people what to do and more time sort of nurturing and nourishing them. And, you know, I, I've seen that as a administrator. Um, you know, it's easy to tell, easier to tell people what to do and say, if you don't do this and you don't do that, these are the consequences. And for the 5% of people that don't do what they're supposed to do, it's a better plan and I can document it and I can track it. But the 95% who actually do what they're supposed to do, that model doesn't allow for creativity. It doesn't really allow for growth as individuals, as a, as a work team in any way. And so I've really seen that if we, if we quit just telling everybody what to do, um, give people more choices and Get, take more input and that that we're all happier we get along better there's less resistance there's less sort of superficial goody goodiness and and each person can bring their strengths to the table and that's true for our kids and that's true for our workplaces i i i got good grades i'm just gonna say this now don't get me wrong <laughs> okay yeah, you probably wouldn't be where you are today <laughs> Right. You know, and I remember uh, uh, one of my math teachers deducted two marks because I didn't show my work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what's the point? I got the answer right. Like you want to put me, you just want to deduct grades. And these are a lot of cumulative deductions. And just because I didn't do an extra two lines, it doesn't matter. I skipped one of them because I know it. It was like, well, you have to show it. And it was, you know, it was this idea of like, when I ask why, and it was like, well, because that's the rules. And even at 15, 16, the, the, the rules, you know, what rules? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's confinement to a certain extent. And I understand it's processes and you're supposed to learn, but I, I if you want results, we'll give you the results. You know, mm -hmm. I understand that there's a thought process that has to go into it, but it's clear that we know it because we got the results and it wouldn't give me my marks. And that just right. led me to rebel in his class. And right. You know what well, I mean? Well, look, we need enough rules to have enough structure so that we don't have chaos. I mean, you all said we were supposed to be online today at a certain time. And so we need to get online at a certain time because we need, there needs to be some structure. Yeah. Um, so I don't think this is an all or none, like throw out the rules. But on the other hand, I think you need rules for sort of the outside to keep, to keep us all safe. And, you know, I, I can't get on at one time and you get on at another time and the Facebook live feed starts at a different time. It's crazy making. But then within the, those confines, I think allowing for more flexibility. So it's like, this is a very different conversation because you didn't give me the questions and say you have 30 seconds and you do it this way and this is the order. It would be a whole different conversation. 
Now um, we can turn this into interrogation now, Doc. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll comply. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll comply. It's, it's, I think for me, conversations, I was always, I have a bit of a gift of the gab. Like, you know, I was, when it was, um, it was thrown at me a lot for being different or for, for so many different reasons. And I just, I'm young and I don't know. So I just kind of, if I'm the best at football, then everyone will like me. If I'm the best in my Quran school, everyone will like me. If I'm the best uh, cool guy with the cool guys, then I'm, then I, you know what I mean? It was this mm -hmm. constant search for validation in my, in my, in my way. But now that I'm older, I feel like these conversations, me, you know, it's just a conversation, mm -hmm. but the resistance, there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of, you know, there's no, there's no kind of, let's have a fair disagreement. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't always mean that if I'm talking to you, that I'm right and you're wrong because my point is the right point. And like, and if you do that on a, that confrontation with you and yourself, if you can't have that with a stranger, how are you, how can you do it? You know, mm -hmm. How can you look at yourself and go, oh, I need to work on myself if, if you're blocking everyone from outside to even, you know, just change. I mean, for me, if I can come out of any conversation with a better perspective on anything, mm -hmm. then I feel like that that's a really good conversation. Yeah, no, I, I think that's so true. And I think to some extent what you're talking about is allowing ourselves to be open open-minded to be curious um to you know I, I was sort of saying before we went live today you know it's I, I would so prefer to be in your country and get to see your country and meet people to have a conversation like this Please. um Please come as, as soon, i'll hook you up that would be, that would be awesome as soon as, soon as i'm as soon as i'm allowed i would really like that and and i think you know part of that is being open and and learning and being interested in talking to people who see the world similarly and finding the learning about those sim, uh, see the see the world differently and learning about those differences as well as finding you know common ground and i think that that's true with ourselves inside ourselves too that it's about being respectful and curious towards other and being respectful and curious about ourselves and i think part of being in in therapy or being in counseling or being in support groups, whatever it is, is having an openness to say, this is who I am. I wanna to get to know more about why I am the way I am. And maybe these are some things I wish would be different. And I'm gonna to try to make these changes. And some things say, well, this is just kind of my personality and how am I gonna make the best of it? Um, you know, how, what am I gonna to do to make the best of it so I can and have as good a life as I possibly can? If if you're if you were someone hypothetically who was very loud, extrovert, had a lot of friends, and all of a sudden you're no longer there and you're locking yourself away. And that is surely an indication of something going on. And if the I suppose I'm just looking at this, trying to kind of recall, had it not been for my experiences and those feelings mm -hmm. that were sadness, that were, uh, you know, he a heavy load, like even at a young age, you know, most of it was because of interactions with people who we just didn't understand you and didn't you know you were bullied you were pushed around because you were short mm -hmm. <laughs> I was shortest so I was mm -hmm. picked last <laughs> and I was mm -hmm. too brown to be <laughs> to be mm -hmm. part of the group or whatever right but mm -hmm. all of these things are happening now in a different setting it's happening on social media like mm -hmm. before if it was just a group of your friends and you had other groups of friends so like your school day finished then you went and found your, you know, your friends who were your neighbors or part of your football team, or mm -hmm. you had another group. Whereas now, 
if you are someone who is in a you know on social media or even playing video games and, and that world and you're always kind of you have your online community and you have that kind of uh, group but you're also 15 and you're exposed to so much mm -hmm. and that will have its effect. It will continue to have something if there's no outlet, if there mm -hmm. is no, I guess, grounding. And mm -hmm. the people around you, as much as your parents might say something, your cousins or whoever you're close, uh, you know, if you're living with a single parent or if you, whatever your situation is, if that, if your core group, let's call it, is not allowing for this kind of conversation what do you do yeah so i i think one of you know what <laughs> excuse me the first things is it is really important for us to look out for each other to notice if somebody who's been always extroverted is really shutting themselves in their room or somebody who's always been a good student is struggling more or, um and and to reach out and to say to people you know that you notice the change and you care and you're concerned and to check in. So I think one thing is to shift our cultures in a way so that people are just more mindful to do that. But if you feel like that's not happening in your circle, in your group, one thing I'd say is sort of look a little bit outside. Maybe there's that mentor that you mentioned or that teacher or that boss or somebody who's a little bit outside your normal vision that you might be able to connect with, who might be able to, to help you. But if you're really feeling kind of all alone, to me, that's the time to say it might be helpful to have somebody to talk to, that to, somebody to kind of help you figure out what's going on, why you're struggling, um, and, and help you, again, you know, feel better about yourself and, and figure out how you want to lead your life. So, uh, you know, again, <clears throat> we want the individual to take responsibility for themselves, but I also think we need to make some shifts in our the way we interact with each other because I think we can make it easier for people. I think it's easier if somebody says, hey, I care, I'm concerned, you want some help trying to figure out how to get professional help. or that, I think that's actually easier than feeling like you have to sneak around and, and figure it out. But on the other hand, there is help out there and help honestly makes a difference. I too struggled with depression starting at age 18. So we have that similarity. And I was fortunate enough to be able to get into therapy as well as get some meds. And, and, and I think that combination for me at that time was what made sense at other times in my life. For example, I did need medication. Um, other times I didn't need therapy or medication, but Different things work at, at different times for us. And I, I do think it's best if we can support each other in doing that. But if not, there are, there are ways to help. And as I mentioned, some people might be more comfortable starting with an app. Um, you know, there are sort of mindfulness apps out there right now that really help. But there are also apps for things like anxiety, depression, social anxiety, phobia, obsessive compulsive problems, whatever, whatever eating issues one of them there's this um like random like anonymous uh, aid there's like apps that you can just kind of go into it's it, they're really cool you just kind of, it's like a random chat room mm -hmm. it's got, it's got an mm -hmm. alias and you just vent and then people share stories um in this kind of virtual uh therapy group if you want mm -hmm. to call it that Mm -hmm. I, I remember I was invited once to a school to give a talk about culture and you know it was, it was I think they were in year eight so they would have been fifth, 13 14 and for me that's part of like hey hey this is how we do this is different this people are different it's you know yay and I didn't understand that I was, I thought it was, I was doing it for fun, but I didn't understand the impact I had. And then mm -hmm. one of the kids after, 
he just came to me and took me aside and he's like, I really want to talk. And you seem like a guy who would listen. Mm -hmm. And I just felt so guilty, like being part of this community and being someone who could definitely do that Mm -hmm. for someone. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, he's 14 and he, I started, I broke down. I was like, why are you coming to me? I don't know. I don't know what, how to help, but mm-hmm. if you ever need to talk, please. Right. Well, you know? and, right. And I think that's the argument on the other side of, you know, go outside the country this, you know, as far away as you can to get help is that for many people, having somebody who looks like them, sounds like them, knows sort of the environment that they've grown up in or live in can be more helpful because they can be like an inspiration or a mentor or a coach in those ways. Um, and, and you are so right that um, people, um, people are drawn to different people and, and that, you know, while some of us may be trained therapists, you know, anybody who's good hearted can become a good mentor, can really take kids or young people under their wing and really be there for them. And, and um, I think all of us can benefit from some mentors and some coaches who just go out of their way for us. So I, I think that's something really important for before, each of us to I, consider doing. Before I throw to Instagram, mm-hmm. um, there's just if we can sum up the the step you know the the moving from you know the ignition just to use your car (laughs) uh, you know how do you how do you start moving the car you know what does it take to does it always have to be breaking point or should we normalize it to a sense of just you know how are you kiosks everywhere? Right. Yeah. So I I actually think we need to normalize it more. One of the things I sort of started to talk to people about during the pandemic is, you know, we were supposed to take our temperature every day, our body temperature. And I think everybody needs to take their wellness, you know, their emotional temperature every day and sort of say to yourself, Hey, you know, my emotional temperature has been running high now for a couple of weeks. And that tells me that maybe I need to, you know, put the, get the car going and get myself going to get some help. Um, I don't think, I mean, if, if we, you know, we don't want your temperature, your physical temperature to go so high that you end up in the ICU on a ventilator. You know, we, we've seen, we want, we want you to notice as it's going up and before it gets to that point, you need to start intervening. And I, I think it's the same with the emotional temperature. And I don't mean the one day it goes up a little bit, you know, but I think if it's, if it's, a, if it's running a little high every day for a couple of weeks or it starts going really high even for one or two days, that's time to stop and say, what's going on with me? what am I stressed about? What can I do to help myself? What have I done? What's worked in the past? How did I get through things like this? And if it just feels like outside my lane to be able to manage this, then, then how am I going to get family, friends, professional help, um, spiritual help? What am I going to do, uh, a mentor to, to help myself? Because my emotional temperature is too high. And no, we don't want to wait till it's the breaking point and we're in the emotional ICU. We do not want to wait till then. On the other hand, for some people, that's what it takes to get help is that breaking point. And know that about yourself. And if you're one of those people, we have to, you know, in alcohol, we talk about hitting bottom. I'd say for this, our emotional temperature just gets dangerously high, then get help then. It's never too late. For me, it's it's rage, <laughs> and meditation is uh, definitely the thing that kind of is my. I'm anchored towards. I when it got too much in life, you know, throws things at you, and I lost it. It was like, oh, I need a um, 
<laughs> I need to go back to that. Uh -huh. But let me ask this, this is the first question here on Instagram is my close friend is struggling with depression or is bipolar. What are some of the do's and don'ts? Yeah. So I, I think that I know that's really hard when it's somebody we care about and we can see them struggling. So I think one of the do's is to check in with them, is to let them know we care about them and um, is to encourage them to seek professional help. If you're that worried, it might be bipolar. That's the kind of thing that somebody actually will need medicine in addition to counseling. Um, then sometimes it means finding help for and with them, even taking them to the first appointment or going with them online, sort of getting them set up. Because as you were indicating before, when people are struggling, they don't have the energy to figure all this out. You know, when our emotional temperature is getting really high, figuring out who to see and what to do is really hard. And sometimes we need to go so far as, as, to, um, as to help people. Um, but the most important thing you can do is be there, let people know you care, do activities with them, and try not to boss them around or be critical. Because as you were saying, that doesn't work so well for anybody. No. no. Um, another question is how do you preserve your mind from negativity? How do you, you know, what, when there's yeah. a lot of negative thoughts, well, how do you, what do you do? Yeah, so there's two different kind of approaches to this and one approach speaks to some people and another approach speaks to other people. So the first approach that people talk about is what's called thought stopping. You have a negative thought, you, you either stop the thought or you challenge the thought. So you, I have a negative thought, I say, oh, I'm ugly, and I replace that with another thought, or I challenge it and say, well, you know, actually, my hair looks okay, and this looks okay, and, you know, sort of challenging it or asking other people for input. So you either stop it or you challenge it. That's kind of one model. The other model is, I think of it more like um, waves. So you say, I have a negative thought and I allow it to run a wave. I don't try to stop it. I don't try to manage it. I just allow it. It comes like a wave, it goes and it goes away. And if it comes again, and st instead of struggling with it, just sort of allowing it. And, and uh, think, think for yourself which of those might work better for you and you can try one. And if that doesn't seem to work so well, you can try the other. The first one, if you're interested, there are workbooks like on cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, and there are workbooks and apps and along that model. And the second one is either a more mindfulness approach or more acceptance and commitment therapy approach. And so though, for those of you who wanna look further into it, those are sort of the two different models. Um, another question is, if you are in a toxic work environment, what do you do? <laughs> now for me, let me... Yeah. It's very difficult because you have, you're a part of a team and there's a leader and there's a corporate ladder and there's a structure and there's your livelihood, you know? Sometimes we'll oh, just leave your job. It's not that easy. Right. And, and toxicity in the workplace is sometimes from this organization as a structure because it is made to build this, you know, uh, it's not there for everyone to work together. It's kind of very competitive and, you know, it's all on merit, which is mm -hmm. competition merit and stuff like that, which I'm not opposed to, but if, if, the, if there's the underlining stuff, you know, the I am the boss, mm -hmm. the, the know your place, the this is not good, this is not good enough. And then that turns into more of a attack on the individual rather than the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so, so I think there are a number of things and I was once in a toxic work environment. So I, I certainly understand unfortunately, what that is. And now I'm in a really wonderful work environment. And, 
and feel and see the difference. So one of the things about a toxic work environment, just like a toxic relationship with a partner, is it's not like one day you say it's toxic. It's like slowly eats away at you. And sometimes people don't even realize it's toxic until it's like really bad or even when they get out of it and they start to get better and they see like how, how bad it really was. So I think that when you start to notice that, that things don't feel right, it's beginning to try to do things to change it, see what you're doing in the dance that you can do differently, see if there are other people that maybe have similar reactions to you and see if you can kind of connect with them, get some support. Um, sometimes I found it helpful to people if they get like a consultant or a coach from outside the environment to kind of help them get the picture, figure out what's going on, figure out how to navigate it so they don't end up feeling horribly about themselves. Um, and then you have to decide, is this a place I can stay and either cope, adapt or modify? Or is this just an untenable situation? Um, th this is just really bad for me personally, professionally. And then again, I go back to those values. You know, this is really bad, but it's the only X in my community. And I, my partner lives here, or my kids are embedded in schools. And so you, you, I, I actually encourage people to make a list of all their values on separate pieces of paper and like rank order them and decide, you know, no, my quality of work experience it really needs to be at the top here, in which case then you need to make one set of choices or my family stability, that seems to go higher. And so I'm gonna to have to figure out maybe how to have more things outside of work that give me pleasure. Um, I'm just gonna to try to not get so caught up in this. Um, and sometimes it's just like, no, this is, this is so bad on me. This is, I'm not being productive. I don't feel good about myself. I, my relationships are suffering. I, I'm having symptoms I need to get out. I'm having headaches or stomach aches or emotional distress. I need to get out of here. So I think it's a process um, and of figuring out sort of what your steps are and being really intentional about it. And don't feel like you're alone with it. You need to have some people you can talk to to help you think through it without them telling you what to do because nobody can come up with those, those values except you for your life. It's a lot of work to stay sane, huh? It is. It is. It, it is a full-time job. It's a full-time job with some fun in the in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question. Sorry, I had a little. Um, it's not time for jokes now. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Actually, humor humor is a wonderful way to cope with stress. It's a really wonderful adaptive way to cope with stress as long as it's not humor at somebody else's expense i mean for me it was a defense mechanism yeah uh, that uh, it was if i'm the loudest and i was the funniest or the most entertaining then I, they'll stop calling me names basically <laughs> and, <laughs> you know but it was yeah. it's all good like it's it's I'm not, I'm not saying this, that like, this is a result of therapy for me. Uh -huh. you know, this is yeah. maturity through a lot of work. Well, I'm uh, really glad therapy has been so helpful to you and that you're willing to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, if, it's, if I can benefit from it, then if we just share these experiences, hopefully someone else will benefit and it'll make someone else's life a bit better. So uh -huh. why not share people's stories like? It's all about, right. for me, storytelling is at the core of everything. And if we just share stories and have conversations, something good will definitely come out of it. And the worst thing out of a conversation is that you disagree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> you know? No, absolutely. I think it's fine to disagree. I mean, as long as we're respectful and kind and disagreement is just part of life. It's part of relationships. You, so as a comedian, I... People getting offended at jokes. It's like, then don't come to the comedy club, <laughs> you know, or don't come to my show. Your jokes are offensive. Is like, that is something like for me that I'll never understand. 
if the intention is not to offend, or even if it is, are we, is, is offense, is taking offense to something like, I don't, like being offended, like, okay, I'm offended. And what? <laughs> like, I don't know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And then people asking for an apology. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do there. You know, if it was like, if it is an issue one-to-one -one, then fine, we'll have a conversation. Mm -hmm. But then it's, it's more animosity from the outside in than it is me trying to prove Mm -hmm. It's just a joke, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think, look, if we are really offended by something, if something comes across to us as a microaggression, for example, and um, I do think we need to bring that up and talk to people about that. Um, you know, I think that happens in relationships and we have to be able to talk about those things. You know, as you said, you know, you were brown and so certain things happen and that's really not okay. And, and people don't need to just put up with that. And on the other hand, if there's entertainment, we all have to choose the entertainment we enjoy. And, and for some people that's comedy and a certain kind of comedy. And, and I think, you know, when you go to whatever it is you go to hear or see or participate in, that there's going to be ups and downs for it, of it. And there's going to be things you like and things you're not so happy about. And, and how do you keep some perspective on that? Yeah. Um, uh, well, let's, and, let's stay with mental health for this next question. Is there any proven link between mental and physical health? Absolutely. There's lots and lots of evidence of links between mental health and physical health. That there, there's certain st physical stress conditions that are you know, if we're really stressed mentally, that we can have those physical stress conditions. Um, there's other conditions that can be made worse by our mental health and not being able to cope with it. And then there's some physical conditions that having them can make us sad. They can make us anxious. They can cause us to have delirium, for example. So there's lots of connections between the two. On the other hand, there are certain physical health conditions that are in no way connected to mental health. So I don't want anybody to think I got cancer. Is it because I didn't cope with my stress? The answer is absolutely no. Absolutely not. Having cancer can lead you to feel, you know, stressed out. And that's understandable. And so, you know, the more you can mobilize your resources and, you know, be as resilient as possible, the better you'll get through the situation, but your mental health does not cause you to have cancer. So I think you have to look at different things differently. Just reading some of the interactions with us on Facebook. Um, another important factor to mental health in the GCC is a need, needed support for expat women to the region and shoulder a large weight of responsibilities of home, children, self-care, and the support of husbands' careers, services for this would be greatly utilized in the country. Uh, that's not a question, but yeah, this is, thanks for getting involved. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah, yeah this, there's I, a lot, there is a lot. This is, I mean, at the start of the conversation, we were talking about the stigma associated to it, right? That it is the society. Society does dictate certain, you know, the rules. The social faux pas that was a social faux pas is now something that is serious, you know. It's not just a social faux pas anymore. People are being, you know, globalization and social media and the world is changing. Mm -hmm. Communication tools. We live in this, you know, you're in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm in Doha, Qatar. And we're having a real time discussion over a, <laughs> this is meant, right. you know, like this couldn't happen 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the fact that this is happening is, is a lot of positivity. So, but with this comes a lot of responsibility as well. So I understand right. why there would be reservations or like, no, this is not, the, it's just a chat. But it? yeah, but what I would, one of the things I would say to the, 
person who who wrote in that i mean to me support groups can be really helpful for some of the situations that you're talking about and and so you know one of the things that people are doing are forming these online communities now of you know kind of reaching out and saying hey i'm and sort of describing what you just described there and if there are other people kind of interested in talking about these struggles can we form a community and maybe you do it in just a peer support group and maybe you get a, a leader who has some expertise related to it. It depends on what the situation is, but you don't have to be alone with all of those things that you just listed. And maybe you won't have people in the group who have every one of those things, but I am confident that you are not alone. And that if, if you know, other people who resonate with that story could, could start to bond together and find a way to support one another. I'll just read this comment as well, because I feel like it's, uh... This is such a crucial discussion. I find mental health is frowned upon in our cultures in the GCC. We just need to get over emotions and toughen up. Discussions like this are crucial to normalize talking about it and finding effective solutions. So I guess for we got some immediate validation and, and I thank everyone for being part of this conversation. And, and just, you know, for anyone listening, there will be subtitles added to this and uploaded to the YouTube channel and where it will stay for, you know, until someone else decides to take it down. I don't know. I don't have control over that, but for me, it's, it's, it's these kinds of discussions that, um, you know, this is the purpose of having these conversations. Uh, one last question from social media and then me and you can wrap up as I'm, I'm sure it's what time is it where you are? 12, 15 PM. Lunch time. I'm keeping you away from lunch. <laughs> yeah, that makes it sound like I get a lunch time. <laughs> oh, no. No. Yeah, that would um, be nice. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, the question is, how do you deal with narcissistic people? Wow. Well, that is a big question yeah. and and quite frankly um that's something i struggle with i'll be honest with you that that i i struggle with with people who are narcissistic so the person who asked that is certainly not alone i think it's really hard when people seem kind of full of themselves and when they have a hard time being empathic so i i understand that it's really difficult one of the things that has helped me a little bit is there, I read a book called Shame, The Underside of Narcissism. And I'm not necessarily, rec I'm not recommending that book. What I'm saying is it helped me appreciate that people who are narcissistic underneath it really don't feel very good about themselves. And they actually get ashamed pretty easily. And so that's helped me have a little more compassion for them and appreciate that when they're all full of themselves, it's actually because they're pretty insecure. Um, but but it's most of us find it hard talking to somebody who's narcissistic or interacting with them because they they have a hard time being understanding and compassionate toward us in a genuine way, and it's all about them. So I, I get it that it's hard. Um. This is kind of something I just want to being misunderstood sometimes, you know, is I wrote a short film and one day, hopefully when I have, you know, when I'm not working on 26 projects at the same time, <laughs> it'll get made. But the idea of it was that if it is that sense of insecurity and it comes from my memories and constant search for validation of, it's not just, I'm a person, I'm here. It's finding some group that will say, okay, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll chill. <laughs> We're okay. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you have to go through a lot. Um, there are, there are moments where, and, you know, I went from being bullied to becoming the bully. And then I went from, it, it, I mean, it, it was a very, go from one place to the next. And 
I guess picking up from my previous experience, if I was in that school, they did this. So when I come to this school, I'm going to do this. And there's a lot I don't know. Mm-hmm. And when it came to a point of chest out walking around and ego being inflated to the <laughs> highest degree, <laughs> being ashamed, and mm-hmm. being, you know, caught out for being an idiot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just, you know, there's no, you know, because it was just one layer. It was like, okay, next page. Oh, it's blank. <laughs> right. <laughs> and right. That, and that for me is like, I cannot be in that position again. There's something mm-hmm. going on here. I can't be full of myself when there's nothing in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. But that's a but that's a hard reckoning for a lot of people. That's a really hard reckoning to go from being the victim to being the bully to I mean you didn't bully me today at all. So my guess is you're not a bully anymore. Oh um, no. No, no. And, I, I, and to sort skills. of go <laughs> to go to go beyond that and realizing that you can't really have meaningful connection if you're bullying people or being bullied. You know, and so you know, I think that's sort of the growth in each of us. And, you know, it's really important. Yeah. And we can all grow and get better. I honestly, is regret part of growth or is it not? Because I feel like sometimes I don't regret. Yeah, I don't, I don't see regret as part of growth. I see taking appropriate responsibility for ourselves and our actions as part of growth. But I think with that also needs to come forgiveness toward ourselves for those actions, as well as forgiveness toward other people. So I I don't know that we need to regret, but certainly we need to own our part in things, but in a way that's very gentle with ourselves. Okay, and just picking up off from the sports thing, and I think this will be our last kind of chat because this is becoming somewhat of a fad. And I, um, it was it it became a thing: food and diet, and 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 mental health and physical health. And for me, I was overweight, and that was a lot of it did affect my mental well-being. And the, the first thing that was, you know, suggested was changing my diet. And now gluten-free diets and keto diets and paleo diets. And there's so many things. I'm an, I'm an advocate for try everything at least once and see how it goes. But try it for yourself, not because everyone else is telling you to. And in your, I mean, for me, I did see results physically. And I, that did boost my mental well-being and having compassion and understanding. It's made me a better husband. It's made me a better uh, person at work. It's made, it has helped a lot. And it's made me realize certain values of people. You know, there were people around me that genuinely loved me and cared about me, but were too afraid to reach out because of how I was behaving. And those moments and those realizations don't come easy. And they are a big responsibility once you have them, because it's just seeing them and leave, and, you know, it's like, oh, cool. That's not, <laughs> there's no learning. <laughs> there's no, mm-hmm. you know, but if, if you were to, would you associate diet or food or whatever? Cause we talked about the car, if the petrol is not the right thing, does it, are we, is it just a fad? Or is it something that is, you know, being pushed by groups who are, you know, vegan and what is it, keto and gluten-free and, you know, is this this something that, not, I'm not picking these, it's just, all over my right. Instagram nowadays. So. Right. So, <laughs> so look, I think what I would say is there's a pretty big normal range that's healthy, that's normal. If you're in that normal range, tells me 
that you're doing okay. I think if people are outside that range, either too low or too high, to me, it tells me they're struggling with something. Something's not going okay. And their weight is sort of a, a public display as well as a, a personal notice. And so I think that that it's important for all of us to do whatever we can to be as healthy as we can. And staying in that normal weight range in that weight range is, is actually really, really important. I think we know, you asked if there's a link between mental health and physical well-being. Well, there's a link between our weight and our well-being. Not one number, a, a big space, but it's important to be in that space. Different things are gonna talk to each of us about what works. This kind of diet, that kind of diet, this app, that app, going to groups. There's a million ways to do it right now. I would agree with you. Try each one, but you got to try them like for a month. <laughs> can't do, you know, keto on Monday and Weight Watchers on Tuesday and Nutrisystem on Wednesday and vegan on Thursday. It doesn't work that way. Like then it, you will not change your weight. So you, if you're going to try this something, good. you really got to try it for a month. I have... You know, people, I usually keep my weight at a pretty good level. It went up a little during the pandemic. I was exercising less. I was more sedentary. And a friend of mine and I, you know, decided what we were going to do to sort of take some weight off. I think it's, for me, it's better not to be alone doing that. And we check in once a week and it's been really helpful and it's been really supportive. And I got back to, you know, something that I feel comfortable with. And so I think, it doesn't matter what you do, but you shouldn't do 10 different things. Try one, see if it works for you and try not to do it alone, whether you want to go to a group or check in online or have a friend or family member doing it with your partner. Lots of ways to do it, but sort of physical, physical wellness and mental wellness are intensely connected. They're really intensely connected. Yeah, and I think discipline, we didn't talk about that at all. And for me, when you start getting into a routine and you discipline yourself to it. For mm -hmm. me, it was a goal. I had a goal, mm -hmm. short-term goal, long-term goal, mm -hmm. setting goals and building right. a strategy to achieve those goals. And then out of that strategy became, it, was, it, it started like, okay, here's what I want. And then all the way down to today, tomorrow, the day after, and the day after, and the day mm -hmm. after. And then holding myself accountable. Mm -hmm. And I'm very lucky to have you can't you can never do anything alone and i'm very lucky to be surrounded with really great people in my life mm -hmm. and, and i and i hope after the pandemic i can come and meet you and some of those people i i would love it and i think i'm you know i've had a great time chatting and likewise i welcome you anytime i welcome anyone who's listening outside to come and check out doha and Qatar, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And uh, it's pretty chilled out space. <laughs> um, cultural nuances aside, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And thank you, uh, Dr. Kazar. I really enjoyed our chat. And I hope Likewise. that we see you again. And I please stay in touch. And uh, I have extended my invitation to you. And as part of our culture, you can not turn it down. So when things are... When things are uh, free flowing and we stay in touch, you come to Doha inshallah and hopefully we'll have this uh, face to face in the studio here. <laughs> I, I would really enjoy and appreciate that opportunity. And thank you so much for, for honestly, not just the questions, but for being so honest and so open because I think the only way we can shift stigma is to acknowledge ourselves, our own struggles and our own pain and that we got help and it made a big, big difference. Yes. Yes. And if I can, I mean, at the end of the day, people are watching this. So if it helps anyone or it guides anyone and the interactions that we're getting, the questions, it definitely means that people are interested and let's keep doing this. And hopefully you'll watch the next episode of Swallow too. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Great talk. Bye-bye. Likewise. Okay.